welcome. I'm Philip Alexander, the senior editor of Banker Magazine. I'm here in the headquarters of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, ahead of the EBRD's annual meetings, which will be in Istanbul in Turkey. Uh, and with me is Eric Bergloff, the chief economist of the EBRD, to talk about the priorities for policymakers to maintain a healthy banking system in Central and Eastern Europe. Eric, uh, about a year ago or more, uh, there was concern that the crisis in the Eurozone might cause a, a credit squeeze in Central and Eastern Europe, especially the countries where Western European banks had a significant presence. Have those concerns eased now, or are there still signs that credit conditions are constrained in the region? We, we definitely had a, a credit squeeze, in particularly in the second half of 2011. Things have since calmed down a little bit, so it's still going on. What, what's happening is there's we call deleveraging, so re reduction of exposures in our country's op operation, particularly now in, in Southeast Europe, it's still continuing. In Central Europe, it seems to have halted for the moment. And is that the product of um, particular Western European banks, for example, the banks in Greece, scaling back activity, or has it been a, a more general trend? It's a more general trend that it's very much driven by what's happening in the parent banks. So less about demand conditions in the countries. It's really about you know, these banks trying to meet the capital requirements and uh, maybe re reorienting a bit their, their uh, strategies uh, in the region. Um, in terms of credit demand in Central and Eastern Europe, is that still healthy at the moment? Uh, is that demand coming from um, households and small businesses? Um, and are those borrowers viable from the point of view of the bank's risk management? Well, I, I wouldn't characterize the situation as, as healthy. I mean, we have most of the countries now either in very s slow growth or in, in recession. So clearly there is an issue of, of, uh, of demand as well. But what we saw from the crisis is that in the early parts of the crisis, a lot of uh, large companies were affected because they had access to other forms of finance and, and bank finance, and that other form of finance disappeared. What you see now at, at the later part of the crisis is that small and medium-sized companies are being affected very much because they depend so much on, on banks. And of course, they also are some of the more risky as, uh, forms of lending for the banks. So clearly they are suffering at the moment. So I think there is a need to also help uh, these uh, small and medium-sized companies get access to, to credit and, and encourage banks. And this here again, I think the international financial institutions and the EBRD can help to uh, foster that that type of, of, of lending and maybe be part of sharing some of the risks in involved. And other companies in the region, again, I guess it, it may vary by country, have they adapted to the needs of borrowing from the banking sector in terms of the sort of reporting and the disclosure that they're able to give the banks to, to provide access to credit? Is that an area that the EBRD works on to improve the, the understanding of the borrowers themselves? Well, I, th I think there are a number of issues that we so identified from the crisis. One was, of course, these very large exposures in, in foreign exchange, uh, in, in foreign currency. You saw that both at the household level and in the corporate sector. And that's definitely something we are trying to do something about. It, you know, it's not something you can do in any individual transaction. You need to, to work on the whole uh, financial system of these countries, trying to help develop alternative sources from uh, bank funding. I think we are facing an immediate future with you know less bank funding available and we need to to find uh, al alternative measures uh, to to find uh, funding the EBRD has been heavily involved in the uh, Vienna initiative which was designed to coordinate uh, policymakers and the private sector to ensure that uh, a healthy supply of credit to central and eastern europe was maintained uh, what are the priorities uh, under that initiative at the moment? So, uh, of course, it started in the midst of the crisis when there was a, a very serious risk that uh, liquidity will be withdrawn from, from the subsidiaries in, in the region, in, in particularly in Central and, uh, and Southeast Europe. That we managed to avoid. We then saw that when this delever le deleveraging started again and where we saw that the parent banks came under pressure, there was also reactions from policymakers, in particularly in, in the home countries, trying to accelerate the introduction of new uh, regulatory limits and so on, and trying to 
maybe under threat of their own credit ratings, impose more uh, rules and more uh, regulation that increased the deleveraging. So th when we s restarted the VN initiative, that was really the target, to try to get uh, a more managed deleveraging. We realized that debt levels have to come down in the region, but we need to do this. Uh, we need to manage that process. Now the focus is very much on, on two things. One is to deal with the levels of uh, non-performing loans in the region. It's, w it's very significant in some countries, particularly in Southeast Europe. Uh, the other uh, priority is the banking union. The banking union is something that I think when we started, restarted the Vienna Initiative, we had no idea that we would get uh, such a substantive uh, framework uh, as a possibility. And it's something when we thought of coordination devices, it was much more about individual uh, countries talking to each other, uh, host and home countries uh, uh, coordinating better. Now with the banking union, there's a chance that we will actually have something that is, is, is quite powerful at the level of, of, the, of the European Union. The issues that come out of that for, for our countries of operation is that some of them are part of the Eurozone, some are part of the EU, and can may be able to opt into the banking union. And other countries are, of course, outside the EU maybe yes for now, and maybe they will, they will be able to join later, but some countries that are also part of the sort of European banking system and countries that we uh, care a lot about, they will never be able to, to join uh, the, or never, but not in the, in the foreseeable future, be able to join the European Union. So we need to think about, when we design the, the banking union, we need to think about the countries that are opting in, the countries that are outside the EU, and still depend very much on on the Eurozone bank. So that's uh, a lot of the focus has been about making sure that the system is open, that it uh, takes into account the effects that it has on, on, on these countries that are outside uh, the banking union. So the, the countries in your region of operations see the banking union as, as an opportunity to strengthen that uh, well coordination with the, the parent countries, that the banks that obviously... Yeah, I, I think that, that differs from country to country and Many of them are, are maybe watching the situation. It's not so attractive to maybe join right now because there are still some what we call legacy issues, you know, debt that's been built up in the past that you may you know, be forced to be part of, of, of sharing that burden now. And it's not so attractive, of course, for a country to, to join. At the same time, they realize that if they stay outside, they may be quite vulnerable. So, and Again, there may be differences also in you know how how tempted they are. I think Poland is a country that has a you know, domestic banking system of, of some significance. It's very keen to to maintain that. It's ke keen to keep a certain flexibility, even if it were to join uh, the banking union. And of course, it still has as an objective to join the eurozone. So for Poland, there are a number of complex uh, considerations. For a country like the Czech Republic, which is know, quite reluctant to, to join the Eurozone and has you know, s signaled that it's going to stay out for, for now at least, maybe the considerations are, are slightly different. But, you know, once you have a very powerful banking union with a, a, a single supervisory mechanism, but also a, a fiscal backstop that helps support uh, resolution, for example, then it might be difficult to stay outside uh, for, for many of our countries. You mentioned there have been problems with non-performing loans in the region. Uh, which particular countries and sectors have been affected by that? And how much can multilateral institutions like the EBRD do uh, to assist in working out that, uh, that problem? I think this is a, a very uh, difficult problem. It's something, that it, it's something that has still been realized as we speak. And, and it's something that we don't maybe have a very good idea of the, the full extent of this. And we but I think there are certain things that can be done. Certainly, uh, one country that has very high levels of non-performing loans is uh, Slovenia. In Slovenia, they have formed uh, this uh, asset management company or bank asset management company. And that is a way to try to look at the portfolios of the banks, look at the underlying assets, the, the corporates that are underneath. And here is something that uh, the EBID could very much take part in assuming that there is some kind of framework that guarantees sort of the stability of the Slovenian system as such. So both working with the banks and, and you know, making sure that there is transparency and, and, and the right methodologies used when 
looking at the non-performing oils, but also looking at the underlying assets and, and trying to get those corporates in shape. And I think that's a very important role for the international financial institutions, particularly for the EBRD. How far is the NPL problem in the region then a, a mainly a corporate one, or are there certain markets where retail loans have also caused difficulties? Yeah, I think uh, the, c the countries that I'm thinking of, at least, uh, and, and where we see the sort of highest level, is, is, pr is primarily a corporate uh, issues. But, but there are, as we know, some countries where you also have the retail um, problem. But my, my sense is that the most immediate issue is to deal with uh, some of these corporate um, exposures. We've got a number of uh, new regulatory initiatives coming through, in, in particular Basel III. How do those initiatives affect uh, banks in Central and Eastern Europe and how well prepared are they to manage those initiatives? Yeah. Well, what, what has happened, and, and part of the problem in, in, in Europe at least, has been that some of these rules have been implemented faster than uh, originally anticipated, uh, partly under the pressures that some countries came, Austria, even Sweden, uh, countries that had significant uh, banking presence in, in Central and Eastern Europe, those countries uh, implemented them under pressure and probably this was went a bit too fast and, and had negative consequences for our country's operation. I think when you look at emerging Europe as a whole and maybe even globally, the concern is that some of the measures that are being implemented are not so well suited for, for those countries. So countries that have less developed capital markets, particularly some of these liquidity measures that are being used, those could actually harm capital market development. So that's something that we are quite concerned about. I think when it comes to the capital requirement as such, yes, it's, it will may be difficult in some uh, individual banks. And of course, there will be a major stress test necessary before the banking union comes into effect. So that in that process, we may see some problems on, on that side, but I, I, as I see that as min less problematic for, at least for the, the banks that operate in our region. Is there any sign of a, of a shift, if you like, um, that as some of these problems work through, that there are alternative sources of credit, either local banks stepping up their role in some of the economies that used to be dominated by foreign-owned banks, or the, the capital markets route uh, likely to become more used by, by borrowers in the region? Mm. I think we, we will head in that direction, I mean, in, in both those things. So some domestic banks, particularly in countries that have, uh, still have a sizable domestic bank, and we will see, and we have ad actually already seen saving uh, coming up uh, or deposits uh, increasing in, uh, in the banks active in the region, so also in the foreign banks. I think there are limits to how far that can go, but it's certainly something that we, we want to encourage. At the end of the day, that we have to remember that we want fl capital to flow from Western Europe to, to e Central Europe and to Eastern Europe, and, and uh, of course also Southeast Europe. So we don't want we want to find the best way, the most stable uh, way to transfer those capital uh, flows, and that possibly, or most probably, we're looking back at experience. After all, is the cross-border banking. We saw that cross-border banking was much more stable in the crisis, the more stable than this uh, direct um, lending from foreign banks to, to uh, domestic uh, clients in, in Eastern Europe or syndicated loans. All those other alternative channels were much less stable than the cross-border banking. So I think we need to have a reorientation towards domestic financing and, and other forms of finance than bank finance. But at the end of the day, the capital flows from Western Europe to Eastern Europe has to be channel to a considerable extent by these cross-border banks. And I think now for the first time we have a real substantive framework in terms of the, the banking union. So that's, I think, is, is very good news uh, in an otherwise maybe quite uh, bleak um, growth situation in the, in the region. Eric, thank you very much for your, for your time and insight today. Thank you.